Okay, welcome everyone. So we'll get started because we have a lot to go through. Um, so first of all, hello everyone. My name is Kathy. I'm the Kyopo Program Committee Co-Chair along with Alex Peck. Um, Kyopo is a volunteer-run organization. We're a collective of diasporic Korean cultural producers and arts professionals generating and sharing progressive, critical, intersectional, and intergenerational discourses, community alliances, and free educational programs like this one today. Um, you can follow us on Instagram. You can also join us our newsletter for more events like this. Mm -hmm. So today we have very exciting guests. We have Sio Choi and Misha. This is their work. I'm sure you've seen the beautiful graphic on our social media. Um, so yes, yeah, Sio is a Korean American shaman, author, and founder of Alpha Sisters Publishing, which also published this book right here. Yeah. Um, and she is the creator of Morning Calm Oracle, an Oracle deck influenced by Korean ancestry, and the author of Don't Be a Bitch, <laughs> Be an Alpha, How to Unlock Your Magic, Play Big, and Change the World. She has translated and published Pudoji, A Tale of the Divine City of Ancient Korea, which we're here to discuss today, and Return, Korea's Rituals of Death, Spirits, and Ancestors. She is based in Atlanta, Georgia. Then we also have Misha Goldberg. Misha is a Korean American poet and artist living in Charlottesville, Virginia. Her experiences growing food, serving as an activist and journeying to sacred places have made her a powerful advocate for the earth. <clears throat> Goldberg has exhibited her work in solo shows around the country and with her debut poetry chat book, The Seed is Waiting in the Dark forthcoming in 2024 through Finishing Line Press. Her art crosses the boundaries of genre to both experience and express transformational repair. Performance, ritual, painting, film, costume, and poetry merge in durational, place-based works, gallery installations that insist upon the re-enchantment of the world. Um, so some tech notes briefly before we get started. We have our ASL interpreter here. Thank you so much, Amber, for being here with us today. So for those who, folks who need, if you can just click at the bottom of your screen, <clears throat> the interpretation option. Um, and when you click interpretation, you should be able to select ASL. And I also just remembered midway through intros that we should speak slowly and mindfully um, given the interpretation that's happening. So thanks to those who, um, are helping us with accessibility. Uh, we really appreciate you, Amber and Brandon. And if you ha are having any tech related issues, please feel free to message me or Eugene um, and we'll be able to help you. So as I mentioned at the top, this event is going to be recorded and available on YouTube and as well as Kyopo's website afterwards. Um, as I, I'm sure you all know, this latter half will be a creative workshop. So please take photos and tag Kyopo on Instagram. Um, or you can share via email and we can share your works after with our Google community. Okay, so I think we'll get started. Um, I'm gonna make, uh, I think CO, you are spotlighted. So I think you can just actually just get started. All right, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for joining us here. Um, so today I want, we're going to do a little bit of a sh kind of a share and discussion of our Putoji, the first four chapter, which is based on creation of the universe and humanity, and then do some creative fun play with Misha. Um, so before I go ahead and start in a moment, I'll start reading first four chapters from the original text only. I'll read the original text chapters and then, um, I'll read two chapters in a row, and then I'll go back and give you some uh, information about those two texts. And then we'll pause and have a discussion with Misha and everyone else. So if you guys have a question about it, please uh, make a note of it. And then we could discuss it at the discussion time. So for Budoji, um, I wanted to clarify one thing because I saw that um, when, when we were describing the time that discussed in Budoji as a early Joseon era. Um, so I wanted to clarify that because it might be confusing. There are 
two Chosuns in our ancient history. So if you go to Appendix 3, if you do have a book on Appendix 3, um, I did list out, I'll just quickly show you, you don't have to go to it right now, um, since I'll be, but it talks from the beginning to uh, North and South Korea. Um, so Joseon era, when we talk about Joseon era, that is, uh, what well, when we say Joseon era, that is from 1392 CE to 1897 CE. So that's about 600 years ago. Um, and this is when Confucianism, patriarchy, all this classism structure you see on TV. And um, when we think about ancient Korean time where people are wearing hanbok and there's like, you know, uh, upper class and that time is 600 to 700 years ago. But beginning the first ever documented ancient kingdom of Korean people is Go Joseon, which is Go meaning ancient Joseon. So in the beginning, the Tangun, the founding father who started Kojo-san, um, that's what the Putoji talks about. The Putoji talks about from the beginning of creation of the universe to the Kojo-san period. Um, so when we talk about, oh, this book is gonna talk about early period of Joseon era, we are talking about the ancient time because Kojo-san was 2333 BCE to 238 BCE, it's a, it, the details are there. So between Gojo-san and Joseon era, there is about thousand years difference. Um, so a lot has changed, we could imagine in that thousand years. So again, I just wanna clarify. So Putoji talks about our indigenous wisdom, uh, indigenous time, like the stories of the indigenous front time from the beginning to about 2000 years before, uh, yeah, before, yeah, so BCE. So with that, uh, let me start, let's go ahead and start reading the chapters. Um, oh, I wanted to kind of quickly share, the reason that I really wanted to differentiate is whenever I thought about uh, connecting to my ancestral roots and really embracing my Korean culture and embracing our ancestors way as a Korean American, all I could think about was the things from Joseon era, which was just gross, you know, inequality and classism and uh, patriarchy and misogyny. And there's nothing that growing up in Korea with the influence of those um, cultures still from the Joseon kingdom era, I could never feel connected to my ancestors way. So as a product of assimilation, even though I grew up in Korea uh, until I was 15, I just never felt the need or want to really explore my ancestors' way because I always felt like that's just not me. I'm a feminist. I'm queer. Uh, you know, I'm anti anti racist. I don't want to be any of the things that Joseon era uh, represented. So I rejected that for a long time, thinking that's the only ancestral ways that I could find. When I had an access to Budoji and really read what our ancestors thought and lived and believed thousand years ago, before that, that's when I really felt the connection. That's when I really felt like, wait a minute, our ancestors um, really believed in this, this, this harmony and um, mutual aid and this respect and just, just so much more about that culture and those stories, I felt more connected as a modern um, person. So that's why I decided, oh my God, it's so, it, it just, it, it really lifted all this blocks and programming and resistance I had about my ancestors' ways. Um, and I really wanted to share that with everyone who couldn't read it, um, who couldn't access this story because you don't, you can't read Korean. So that's how it all started. So um, I know we have so much time to kind of discuss and process it. So let's go ahead and start with the chapters. So I want you to get to, if you have the book, um, and Amanda is going to actually show us the pages on screen. But we're going to go to chapter one. Again, I'm going to read chapter one and two in a row. And then I'll come back and give you guys some tips which you are welcome to make notes onto the pages of the book 
then we'll pause and have a discussion. All right, so let's go to chapter one, Mago's Land and the Birth of Mago Samshin. Mago Song is the highest place on earth. It succeeded the heavenly realm in accordance with divine ways. Four heavenly people built structures in each of the four corners and made sounds. The first was Hwangung, the second was Pekso, the third was Cheonggung, and the fourth was Hukso. Gunghi was the mother of two Gungs, and Sohi was the mother of two Sohs. They were both the daughters of Mago. Mago was born out of Jimse and had no human emotions, so she made it with the sky to give birth to two daughters without a spouse. Gunghi and Sohi also received seed from the sky to give birth to two heavenly sons and two heavenly daughters without marriage. In total, there were four heavenly men and four heavenly women. Now let's go to the chapter two. I'm going to go right into chapter two. Chapter two, creation. In the beginning, Mago Song was above Shildal Song, next to Hodal Song. The only light and warmth came from the sun, and nothing yet had shaped. Eight notes of sound could be heard from the sky. Both Shildal Song and Hodal Song came from this sound, and Mago Song and Mago herself came from it too. This was Jimse. Before Jimse, Yulia repeated itself several times to create the stars. Toward the end of Jimse, Mago birthed Gunghi and Sohi and let them manage Oum Chiljo. Finally, earth milk rose from the center of the land. The Hees gave birth to four heavenly men, and four heavenly women and raised them by feeding them earth milk. The four heavenly women controlled Yo, and the four heavenly men controlled Yul. So let's go to the pay, the chapter, beginning of chapter one again. And I just want to kind of go through um, kind of line some of the things. So Mago song you know, the song, so we believe, we're, we can only speculate, and Mago song, I think, is this Mago's paradise, where everything started, Mago's land, Mago's territory. Uh, song could mean castle or stronghold. I do think this was before the time of castle. There's a large group of people who believe Mago song might have been a spaceship, so I think there it's plausible too. So Mago Song is speculated as where everything started. Um, it succeeded the heavenly realm with accordance with divine ways. Divine ways is Chunbu. Chunbu translates as heavenly items, divine items. Sometimes it's Chunbu is sometimes called Chunbu In or Chunbu Sam In which is Chunbu, the divine, um, divine um, talisman, divine uh, spiritual items. And it is considered to be three different items that are often uh, pulled out from old ancient monolith, um, which was a tomb and like a ritual side of our past. And usually there are the bronze mirror, bronze uh, ceremonial sword, and then a uh, shamanic rattle. Uh, but in this book, Chanbu doesn't always talk about those three material items. It also talks about what those items represented, which is, so that's why we, we translate that as divine ways. Um, four heavenly people built structures in each of the corners and made sounds. In some text, they, it could be also translated as, instead of make sounds, um, control the sounds harmoniously. So in some text, that's how it's translated, control the sound harmoniously. So they manage this sound vibration. Um, Huang gung, pek so, chung gung, huk so. Huang means yellow, pek means white, chung means blue, huk is black, so we are 
imagining that these were the skin colors or whatever the color, these they were differentiated by color. So we're thinking they might have been skin color that they are um, separated as. Jimsei is just a term um, just mentioned in Budoji only, and it's considered a, a whole life cycle. So one Jimsei, the dinosaur era will be one Jimsei. Um, human era will be another Jimsei. So we are living in this one Jimsei because Mago came and then humanity came after Mago. So we're living in this one life cycle. Um, so those are some of the tips here. I think let's go to chapter 12. I mean, chapter two, sorry, chapter two. Um, so 실달성, 실달성 is whatever the planet that it, before it became the earth, whatever this material that Mago threw into celestial water or heavenly water creating um, earth. We're going to read about that in chapter three, but 칠달성 is basically preform earth. And then 허달성, if you leave it to be moon, eight notes of sound could be heard from the sky. Eight notes of sound. This is the the, the creation vibration, the source energy. Yulia, this is the Yulia. And we talk about the Yulia, this energy, this sound vibration, this sound notes, vibration of sounds, this energy vibration repeated itself to create stars, Mago, everything from it. And earth milk rose from the center of the land, earth milk in Chiyu. That's the Korean term, if you're curious about that. Um, Kung, oh, I'll, I'll go over Kung in so a little later. I just want to read one um, paragraph. So this is a creation myth in Budoji. There's another ancient text um, that talks about similar creative myth, creation myth. So I translate it for you. So let me read that one. This one is in Samsonggi, which is also an ancient text talked about Budoji's time. There's no text, so just listen to me and maybe, um, so I'll read it slow. In the sky of Siberia, there was one God as a single divinity spread light so th this single divinity spread light to universe, appeared in our world, birthed all things, lived long with joy at all times. Playing with magnificent energy, created nature magically, was shapeless but saw, did not act but created, and did not speak but um, acted. So that's another creation story. There's like this source energy, the source God, that divinity uh, that created everything. Um, so that was the chapter one and two. So now I want us to um, come back to us and Nisha, I could open up to some question about chapter one and two. Um, and have some discussion. So if we could pin, um, we could stop sharing the screen and we could talk about that. Okay. Hey, everybody. Really good to be with you. Thank you, Sia. Um, yeah, these sections are just short and sweet, but dense and full of information, metaphysical information and uh, mythical information for us. And so um, so in chapter one, it's relating how the realm of earth was created through Mago, the divine mother. Chapter two relates how the cosmos was created through Yulio, the divine vibration. And so I'm just thinking about those two concepts, which we're not always thinking with on our everyday, um, but um, a couple of questions I had for us that maybe somebody might want to chime in about um, with how does this revelation of, of, of the a divine mother challenge 
or affirm your notions about the source of life? And how do you imagine our ancestral divine mother? And then also something else to think about is with the, with the divine vibration, how does the notion of a divine vibration resonate with your intuition? What sound, what does the sound look like, feel like, sound like, and when do you feel in resonance with divine vibration? And so if anyone wants to come in with any of the, any uh, reflections on that, that'd be very welcome. Um, Misha, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat that? That statement was so amazing. When do you feel resonance with divine vibration? Is that the question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just, just a little question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a it's deep question. Um, yeah. Mago, while you guys are coming up, Mago, Ma means mother, Go means old, 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 ancient. So that so literally, Mago is divine mother, the first mother, mother of all. Any question? Also, on chapter one and two, you could raise them so we could talk about it and answer it. So, question. My name is Singy. Hi, Sio. Thank you so much, and Misha as well. This is really great. Um, I, I'm realizing a couple things. So, I'm realizing I've I've been doing a form of Korean yoga for a lot of years, and it's wonderful to see the connection between shamanism and everything that you have described that you've been reading about sort of reflected in that in in the yoga and I'm not going to say specifically what it is but it's just it's kind of an interesting connection with the vibration exercises chanjigyun the sounds everything that's done during the practice of yoga I love it I love having that connection to my ancestors now that I wasn't realizing before and the other thing is um I know that I have the same I have the same reaction to you about the chosen dynasty and when I first thought, heard the chosen dynasty, you know, a connection to this, I thought, well, how is this going to work? It's going to be probably kind of problematic. I'm not sure if I want to attend. And I'm so glad that you clarified that. And I know that there were thousands of years of Korean history. And this took me, this took me well, well into my 30s to realize this, where Korean women had these in, just incredible positions of power. And there was a there was a player musical that came out of Queen Men, and that was kind of the first opening for me of realizing that. And and I'm wondering if if you can kind of go into that a little bit more and how that tradition of women and empowerment and the leadership of women came out of um of what you've been reading. I wish that I had um like more definite um validated uh information to share. But we also have to understand that what's remaining in Korea, even in Korean of history and record has been influenced by hundreds, if not thousands years of patriarchy um, and different ideology change. It went from more indigenous, I, I don't want even want to call it Korean shamanism because I feel like Korean shamanism is what's remaining of our indigenous faith, um, but it went from that to Buddhism for almost a thousand years, right? And then from Buddhism to Confucianism, and then the the Westernization and colon like West like Christianity, Westernization, modernization came. So all what well, all that's remaining has been influenced. I couldn't really find things, but I want to share with you. There's school of thought. There are feminist scholars and people who argue that perhaps. The, the whole ma tangun that we think it's like long bearded man, there's a school of thought that they think Han, Hanung, Han, like Hanung and Tangun, they were female. Because here's the reason why, um, because in the Tangun myth, they say at the end of that, Tangun went to the mountain to become a Sanchin. 
And up until Joseon Dynasty, all the Sanshins were female. They were all goddesses. Over the Joseon Dynasty, it went through this Confucianism patriarchy structure. So they changed them into this white haired, long bearded male Sanshin deity. But, but in the ancient time, there's so many records that all the Sanshins were female. Because mountain provided, mountain spirit provided for human. So when you start thinking about that, you're like, was Dangun a goddess, a female priestess, king? Oh my goodness. The Korea like scholars will just fall over, right? So there's no proof, but there are very, very um, like strong kind of a stories like that. There, it, it just doesn't make sense for you to think, okay, we think Mago, um, Mago, Mago and two daughters are Samshin goddess, Samshin, the triple goddess. Um, but then, and then some school of scholars argue, no, it's the Hwan In, Hwan Ung, Dangun who come up later in this book. They represent Samshin. So they think, oh, they're all Samshin. But Samshin is a goddess, it's a female goddess. So if Hwan In, Hwan Ung, Dangun are all male, how do you say they are Samshin goddess of fertility? Where does that gender change happen? Nobody's explanation for it. They're just like, ah, oh, it just is, you know? So I personally really find it that if I could just lift the gender away from this discussion, and we, if we could just say, you know, um, I think, I do think it was just fair, gender didn't really matter perhaps. Um, there are some some researches that I found that, you know, even though he says there was one Tangun, there was like several Tanguns and some of them had, they say these names. So there's, there's this book, uh, it talks about every Tangun that ruled, every Hwanung that ruled in each of those ancient kingdom. Um, and on those names, is, they say the names that ended with this letter are thought to be female. So I think back then there were some more male and some are female. Yeah, I think gender didn't really matter back then. So just to think that that was a possibility in our indigenous way is empowering enough for me. Um, so I hope I answered the question or if I, I don't know if I open bigger can of worms because now you guys have so many more questions. Um, I do, that was fabulous, but I'll wait for others to ask questions. I have more questions. Um. So yeah, there's a question in our chat uh, from Grant. I'll just read it out loud in case um, folks didn't see. It says, this is pertaining to the last portion which you read. Is there more you can tell us about the significance of Siberia and how it may have influenced the beginnings of Korean shamanism and creation mythology? Yes, so Bago Song, the highest place on earth, they believe it to be, it was on the Pamir mountain, it's like near current Afghanistan, Central Asia, like it's a higher altitude area. Um, if you read the Budoji to the rest of it, eventually Hwangbung, the yellow clan, yellow clan, they all leave Magosong and they migrate out. And Hwangbung, which we believe were the ancestor, indigenous ancestors of, of Korean people, they moved to Siberia area the northern, northern, like very frigid. They said it was very frigid and uh, high, high up and very, uh, so that's where we believe that they initially migrated to. And from there on, all this um, stories continue on. So considering the Lake Baikal in near Siberia is the birthplace of shamanism, it kind of makes that connection. Um, when if you go, I, I haven't been, but I the, the the author, the professor Cho has been, took a group of Korean shamans and went to Lake Baikal. Um they have same like spirit divine sticks that Korean shamans do with the fabrics. Their deities that they worship look just like our Sanshin mountain god. So there are a lot of resemblance in in the shamanism near Lake Baikal to Korean shamanism. So I think that's the connection. I think uh, Hwangung, that plan out of Mago Song, 
went to the Siberia region. That's where they continued. The, the story of Pudoji continued there. And then from there, Tangun built Pudo a little bit further south near Korean Peninsula. I hope that's an answer. I think you, and you. Go ahead, you. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you, Teo and, and Misha, so much because this really is a dream come true to um, be able to talk about this with such a um, receptive and excited group. Because as you have said before, um, I have been in rooms or Zoom meetings where people fall over if we question Tangun, um, if we bring up Mago, <laughs> um, if we bring up you know, different kinds of myths uh, that may not um, just, you know, follow the patriarchal lineage of, of mythology. And um, having having been doing doing some studies and research in uh, in the past few years, I feel like this kind of gathering, I, I'm just really sharing my gratitude um, to really bring this to a wider group of people, um, especially because like the way I want to share a quote with y'all that has guided me in, in this work, um, that myths are public dreams and dreams are private myths. And I'll flip it around to say it again. So dreams are private myths and myths are public dreams. And, you know, when we think about this in in how this plays out in politics um, and in nation making, um, the US and, and Japan and China and Korea itself um, have contributed to mythology making to really control the beliefs of, of people. So I think what we're doing here is actually much deeper, you know, um, than just, well, I think the deepest is personal and cultural and spiritual work. And I think what we're doing is actually really expansive um, and does involve a lot of um, just resistance work and labor. And yeah, I am again just wanted to share my gratitude with y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the beautiful quote. Um, I checked the time and we are I feel like we need to go move on to chapter three and four, if you guys don't mind. And then we could come back and make more discussion. But I'm seeing that we're a little behind. So let's just do chapter three and four. So let's get this part done. Um, and then we could open up more. Um, so let's go to chapter three. The Earth Formation. Once Huchun began operating and Yulia reconstructed itself, Harmony was made and there was balance. Mago pulled the Shildai song down into the heavenly water and its energy rose up to form water clouds. Then Shildai song opened up wide, creating land in the middle, the ocean and land aligned side by side and the mountains and streams stretched wide. The earth started rotating and shifting, creating waves. Air, fire, water, and earth began mixing and harmonizing. The sun created day and night and four seasons form, raising plants and the beasts of the earth to abundance. There was more work to be done on all the land. So the four heavenly pairs divided up and managed the original sound. Huang managed earth, Cheng managed water, Baek managed air, Kuk managed fire. Each built a camp in which to perform their duties and their and these later became four clans. Air and fire worked together. There was no darkness or coldness in the sky. Water and earth worked together. The ground had no deformity or ugliness. This was though the sound vibrated, giving light from above and harmony from below. Let's go right into chapter four, the creation of human. While eight heavenly people managed the original sound, there wasn't any responsibility for the continuation of the sound notes. Everything appeared in one moment and disappeared in the next, which was difficult to control. 
Finally, Mago ordered the four heavenly men and four heavenly women to open their sides and procreate. They married one another and gave birth to three sons and three daughters. This was the origin of human beings on earth. The men and women continued procreating over several generations, and the number of humans in Mago Song increased to 3,000 per clan. From this point on, the 12 pairs of original humans guarded the gates while their descendants divided up the task of the continued operation of the sound nodes. Finally, the life force and flow of earth achieved balance. Every person in Mago's land was pure in character, intuitively knowing how to live in harmony with all. Because they only drank earth milk for sustenance, their blood and souls were clear and bright. Their ears had ogum, enabling them to hear the sounds from heaven holy. And they could not only walk and run, but also take off and fly to travel freely across distances. Once their life mission was completed, their bodies turned into gold dust, yet their spirit bodies remained on earth. They knew how to communicate without sound and move around without being seen. The spirit bodies live forever, spread alongside the earth of, uh, energy of the earth. Going quickly to chapter three, I'll be really quick with this. Um, Huchan, so the once Huchan began operating, Huchan is later heaven, basically um, the heaven after Mago came out. So in this Jimse, um, and then it talks about how Mago just threw Shilgaisong planet into the water and the earth as we know it started. I think it's interesting for you to know that back even in indigenous story, there are four natural elements because I had some people saying, oh, Western, like witches talk about or paganism talk about four elements, but Asians are five elements. But if you read Pudoji, you realize in the beginning, it was actually also four elements, um, air, fire, water, earth. But then during the Budoji's time, you read about five element occurs, and then it became more of an ancient um, Asian uh, philosophy that was dominating the Asian culture. But in the beginning, there was also air, fire, water, earth. Um, when they talk about they managed it, I think the life, like the thriving of the living beings, the thriving of the nature and universe, I think that's what they were, the humans were required to manage. Um, when I say, so here on page 26, I said each built a camp. So there are, gung, there are two gung, gungs and two souls, but the camp, I didn't make it into detail, but this is a little tidbit of information. Gung, it's more like has a shape of a cave. So we think, we believe, so they believe, so the gung, the, Kore, the Chinese letter for gung represents kind of has a cave with a snake inside. So they believe Kungs were people who kind of lived in the cave. Uh, they might have worshiped the uh, uh, snake or they might have had some affinity with snake, the mountain cave, so mountains. And then So, the people with So name, So structure is higher structure um, on a field. So higher structure on a field uh, where the bird is sitting on top. So we believe even though they're all humans, there were groups that were kind of living in kind of mountain cave people, like Korean people. And then there were people who were liking to build a higher structure um, to reach the, so these are people who might have built like pyramids later or high towers. Um, so things like that. So they were a little different, but I thought it was overcomplicated to put that in here. So I'm just sharing with you now. Uh, creation of humans going into chapter four quickly. Um, I think what's really cool for us to know is um, human bodies were a lot magical back then. That's what it seems like, um, that, the, 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 that there's a pure connection to the energy of the source. I feel like people, back then had a pure connection. They're able to hear, understand the, the, the divine energy. Um, and because of it, they were also able to, they had a physical, very superhero-like physical strength 
if you watch old ancient Chinese like Kung Fu movies or, you know, things like that, you see these warriors able to kind of fly and travel fast, even into the modern time, there are martial artists who are training that. So I imagine it was something like that. So that's what I have. So let's just open up for discussion again. Just checking the time again, we're a little behind, so. Um, we had a question from Julie and Jackie in the chat. Um, why the emphasis on the sense of sound? Are there other interpretations of this concept? I think the reason they called it 40, the sound is they meant to put them in energy, the vibration energy, uh, because sound wave is an energy. Um, and they talked about light, light, sun was shining. Uh, so they called it sound, um, but to me, it feels like a vibrate. They meant, I, but I don't know what they called energy. <laughs> I think it's more of a vibrational sound. Um, as you know, the, the sound of Korean Shamani Gradle and the drumming, all those were used back in the day in every culture to use, to, it's, it was a way to communicate with the divine. They use it in their ritual, they use it in their ceremony, it was a way to communicate. So um, I think sound is like a kind of a physical manifestation of what we call energy. Um, so I think that's why there's a significance to sound. They're calling it sound. Was there another question? I got that. I did have one question if we had time. Um, so uh, yeah, so I watched the movie Manchin um, and I learned that like for a long time, shamans have been served as a, as a bridge between a person and the unseen forces that influence our lives, like a conduit for the messages of gods, a being that can hold the joy and pain of like natural formations and major events. At the end of Manchin, um, shamans are described as beings that work within the liminal space of the human and the godlike. Um, and being a shaman was compared to the act of standing on the blade of a sword and gaining power from being precariously balanced, overcoming that pain of standing on blades. Uh, could you describe your own shaman practices um, in this way or do other metaphors come to mind? Thank you so much for sharing. That was a, that's a difficult question. Um, I, um, I don't know. I think the metaphor wise, I think it's a beautiful metaphor considering that particular mansion's lifetime and the world that she lived. And I understand the metaphor of living on, standing on the blade because the time of her from Japanese occupation through the war and the modernization and all the um, stigmatization and discrimination against Korean shamanism that happened since then, I think it represents her metaphor. For me, um, because I believe the way that I'm practicing my own faith or, you know, me living up to the label I gave myself as a Korean American shaman is right now, I'm just following the breadcrumbs. Um, and these breadcrumbs seem to kind of have a dim light. So when I get in front of it, the next path breadcrumb shows and I go to the next and I go to the next. So for me, my shamanic is path is very, it feels very different. It's more, it feels like a, a continuing to seek that connection, um, continue to look, be open to see that breadcrumb, breadcrumbs and the little lights that's in front of me and having the faith to follow that path. And that led me to so many like personal and professional changes. Um, so it's almost like, so to me, my Korean shamanic practice is how do I stay as open and as authentic as who I am to see these signs from God um, or spirit from Yulia so source, whatever you want to call it. How do I recognize? How do I get into a place to recognize it? And then when I recognize it, have the courage to surrender and follow through and then create this book. 
you know, create the next book, do a program because that's the breadcrumb. Um, so I guess I'm not as esteemed like Korean shaman that can show up in a movie, but I think the way I'm approaching can be really used by anyone. You don't have to be a shaman. Um, if you could really feel like there's this greater, this Yulia energy that created everything, this, this goddess energy, there are all this manifestation of this powerful energy. If you could have a faith this exists even now, how, how do you have faith and how do you continue being guided by that path? I think that is just but, so powerful. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I interrupted you, Theo, but that is really powerful. And I'm kind of thinking in terms of just these general cycles of destruction and creation, especially after war, um, and especially after the Korean War. Um, Korean women came to the U.S. as war brides, and they became this incredible entrepreneurial force. And they built businesses, and they brought in their additional family members, and then the men. So it became, this is a very patriarchal society that turned matriarchal and there was a tension in that and that played out in the Korean churches right where the men where the Korean churches became incredibly patriarchal because the men didn't have that power they they congregated the churches and so I'm seeing like these like these cycles of the goddess energy and even when you think that oh this is our culture this is who we are as a people we're we're sexist we're racist sometimes or at least that's the tradition in which I what I perceived was my tradition. Um, there, the cycles that continue to repeat and the goddess energy that continues to return. And it's not just Korean culture, but it happens after, it happened after World War I, World War II, when there were no men left, right? And so the women explored sexuality, art, culture, like there's this renaissance of um, goddess energy. And it's extraordinary. And I'm not, a proponent of war. I'm not saying war was wonderful, but I'm just saying it's really interesting how you have these cycles, the story repeating of creation, destruction, create, and then the goddess energy returning. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. Okay, so I just, any more question, um, comment, because we could definitely get back into it. It's, um, I would love for us to move on to Misha sharing about her creative process because I think it's going to inspire us doing our creative exercise. And then some of the questions Misha have put together, we could kind of address it again in our sharing time. Misha, are we okay with that? Yeah, that's great. Okay, okay um, so I'm going to um, present just a little slideshow about the art that I did for Budoji. And I want to uh, preface that by saying that um, Sio and I have been good friends over the past few years. And so we, we were um, swimming in a lake um, at the farm that I was living at. And we're in this beautiful lake. And she's like, oh, you want to, I'm, I'm going to translate this like ancient text into English for the first time. Like, do you want to illustrate it? I'm like, of course. So it was kind of like the, the thought of us being in the water together as women in the water it just like has that significance and like this whole journey together this journey for me personally and like what we like the what we're trying to present to um is just like it has like a depth to it that i feel super privileged to uh, be a part of um so um and i think that's a bit about like this idea of the breadcrumbs that like we're all finding our own breadcrumbs of a way home into ourselves as, um, you know, as diasporic people. Um, so this is the cover of the, of the, um, the book. Um, I really wanted to like express like the motion, the movement, the cosmic energy, the relationality to the stars and constellations that, that I think is really at the core. It's like, connecting to um, who we are and what this world is. Um, you know, behind culture, behind all the things is just our elemental selves. And that's, I think, how our ancestors felt about life is, con you know, connecting to the mountain, the elements, all this. Um, this is just the start of 
of the drawing and painting in my studio. And, you know, that the shape of everything was really inspired by Jade, which shows up later in the um, in the book um, and in the story. And just like this quality of Jade, you know, as this like sacred stone for us and also this seed um, shape and as the, um, you know, the seed of life being really what that creation story is about. Um, so this is the se second painting I did uh, for the book um, where I'll just read this one passage. It says, um, so, you know, this the story, I don't know whoever's read it, but the story goes in, through the creation and the management of like the heavenly energies, but then also like the fall of how humans lose touch with, with their ability, because of their greed and focus on the self that they lose touch with the divine vibration. And so, and then that's when Tangun and um, leads away and tries to create a society where we are able to connect back with the old ways. And so, um, and so that's the uh, city of Buddha. And so this is one passage says, therefore the area's specialties were the three rooted sacred ginseng, the five leaf auspicious pine nuts and the seven color precious jade stones. They were the blessings from the heaven for the people of Budo. And so um, uh, I just wanna share the story that after I finished that painting, I was up by the lake and went into the mountain and and came across this ginseng like really suddenly. And so I felt like that was a really um, sacred sign. And you know, like where I am in Virginia, it's the 38th parallel and that's not lost on anybody. Like the ginseng in Virginia and, and the ginseng in Korea is like the considered the best quality ginseng in the world. And so it's just like a lot of, you know, sacred resonance, you know, Here's a Simani doing prayers um, to the mountain um, before going on a ginseng hunt. Uh, here's a plate of food that we had in Korea because this whole we this whole project was done around our trip to Korea. Um, it was my first trip to Korea after connecting with my family for the first time um, in my life over there, um, and. Um, and here's, uh, and so I did those two paintings um, before the Korea trip. And then the third painting I did as inspired by those experiences. Here's a thousand year old uh, pine tree, a pine cone. So like the, the whole journey brought this experience for me to be able to connect to those sacred items and to the sacred symbols and just like embody what, embody the text through this journey um, home. So it was it was all very um, symbolic and rich for me. Um, here's the, the last painting I did when I got home. And so this um, the this is depicting a ceremony in Budo and I'll just read this from the text is, um, we built the sacred altar on the bright mountain top of Mount Tebaksan and built supportive altars in all four directions. Finally, Budo was complete. It was magnificent, beautiful and bright with light. It was enough to become the heart of the land and the people. Um, this text is so powerful because it, it shows like the yearning to create um, to return to the original instructions of what life is about. Um, and, you know, we're still doing it. This was um, what I based that um, painting on as a journey um, to uh, Tebaksan on um, Gechenjo. Um, this was, they say, is the 4,355th procession up the mountain um, to do prayers uh, to Huan Yung when the sky is, it's just, they say it's the day the sky opened and, um, you know, Huan Yung descended. So um, we're still praying in this way. Um, 
um, here's in a, in a temple uh, picture from 1980 of a uh, uh, painting of uh, Dangun um, up on the altar. And, um, and also the painting, because it, it was such a crazy day because the day of the ceremony is like storming and rain and clouds and cr just crazy and people singing and dancing and, and just like total like divine madness. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, but I want, I needed, I wanted to reference to like the beauty of the mountains and being in the mountain. And so this is me and Sia and our friends um, in Chirisan. And um, here's a, a, a figure of a divine mother. And we went there because of the, of the like mother spirit that is in, um, the land there connected with the mountain and yeah we were really like on the hunt for and for me personally just connecting with family just connecting with Korea for the first time like I was on the hunt for um like for the sacred connection back there with the mountain you know with my mother my mother's family and and yeah so it was a journey and it's, it's really nice to to have it be Im embodied in, in this um, text. So, I... Okay. Um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to uh, answer those. Misha, there was a question from my other study group about Mago wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Um, in your Mago painting, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I I felt like it was appropriate to kind of hide the face, to not make the face like, oh, it's this beautiful Korean woman, you know? Um, because I think like we're so fetishized in that way of like, and and also I kind of like the idea that this text and Mago and divinity, it's a mystery, you know, and like to just abide with that mystery without like, we're not going to just like start a cult and then like all worship this image, you know, it's like, I think that in that openness, that's like a kind of like feminine, queer, um, like, approach that can can have this real openness to our stories and to myths without being like rabid about it so I like that part of the painting yeah and then it's also in our tradition to use you know to use masks too so. I have a question for you Misha hi my name is Jelaine um how do you feel and it I don't know if comparing is really the right concept, but actually being in Korea and like being able to visit these places, how do you feel like that maybe um, influence or impact your artistic practice? Or do you think, you know, what kind of differences do you see um, like in that way? Yeah, I think I have this kind of push and pull as we all do, like across oceans. And so I did, you know, I did this big project connecting, trying to connect in my mind, like traditional indigenous Korean practice with my like embodied um, um, practice and experience on the land here. So the, it's kind of made me reckon with this idea of, of it of grief of loss of indigeneity and so this is something that I work with in my art um a lot because like we have a grief around our loss at the same time we're settlers on Turtle Island and so like I'm here on Monacan land um in Virginia and so like after my trip I felt so intense about like gotta learn Korean, gotta like dive in, gotta like tell my story in, in a way because it, like so many, cause um, 
yeah but then I'm like oh I'm just talking to my friends about being Korean all the time and I'm like I need to step back like step back a little bit and so right now I'm doing a project about um, Lewis and Clark and Sacagawea because I just went this whole opposite direction and reckoning what what it means to be in Charlottesville to like reckon with the ghosts here and like reckon with like the beginning of empire that started here with Jefferson's um, with Jefferson having Monticello here and like with how how like um, like disrespect and survival of indigenous people here and and then making that connection of like so Lewis and Clark like started their journey here and went so far west they crossed the ocean and divided our country in half you know so this is kind of like the connections that I'm trying to make with my art and I feel like it's going full circle back to Korea but I'm still like want to fight like the the like I want to kind of fight settler settler colonialism and those principles here because I'm American you know like my uh, and like uh, my father was an American soldier mom was Korean met over there married here typical story so I still like I'm like oh I'm not ready to go full bore into Korea I still have fights here and maybe I always that'll always be you know my fight so But to um, just to I, circle back is to do it through art and creative ways where there's potential to transmute energy in like, uh, that's not like uh, in creative ways that help us envision how we can, how we can transform spaces and build culture and write new myths, you know, that disregard the old myths. Like this is kind of the project of art and I think is kind of has an interesting relationality to shamanism. That's not like, that's not like needing to connect to be able to translate spirits, but is kind of like in connected to the zeitgeist of how the spirits are guiding us to serve our people, to heal each other in the land. Yeah, I feel like that's like a diaspora way of Korean shamanism. I think that is like Korean American shamanism, um, like one way. I feel like um, I want to quickly answer this question because I know the answer. One, he wanted to know um, the the ritual that Misha attended. We didn't go to Baekdusan because Baekdusan is the one in North Korea. So the one that Misha went to that has. Uh, ceremony every October 3rd, which is Gechonjol, is in Tebeksan. Tebeksan. So they just have it. So you could look at, you know, Gechonjol ceremony, um, and you should be able to find it because they do it every year. So um and Gechonjol October 3rd is the it, it is the celebration of of heaven opening up and Hwanung who started Badal Kingdom who ended up giving birth to Tangun with a bear woman that Tangun myth, he came first. Uh, he came to Tebeksan. Um, so that's where the Tebeksan is. Now, the Tebeksan talks about in this book is not the same Tebeksan in South Korea. We believe the Tebeksan mentioned in the myth is often still like current, current China somewhere, like north of North Korea. Um, however, over the courses of all these years, um, our own Tebeksan in South Korea has an altar um, and has continued on this ritual. So I just want to answer that question just to clarify. Um, and then Lena had a quick question about um, Budoji text. What was the mission of the early human clans? How did they help perpetuate divine energy and sound before being turned to gold dust? I don't know, right? We don't know. Um, but something beautiful, apparently, right? Like humans were, but it did say, yeah, we don't know. We can only speculate and imagine. Um, Tebeksan, correct, Julaine. T-A-E-B-A-E-K-S-A-N, Tebeksan. So now we're at 3.07, still, we're in good place. Should we continue, Kathy? Do you want to give me thumbs up? Continue with a creative exercise. Okay. 
So Misha, this is now our creative exercise time. Um, so Misha, uh -huh. was you? <laughs> We're moving fast. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I just wanted to um, lead us through a little journey so that we can kind of go inward with all this information that we've taken in and like let it kind of settle, you know, settle down to the core of us and connect with that in like a non-linear way. And then we can move from that space into creating for some time together. And it could just be like the beginning of a creation or a listing of ideas or movement or whatever you feel called to. It doesn't have to be a product of, or, you know, have any of those judgments around it. Um, so if everybody would like to just kind of settle in, if you want to take off your shoes, get comfortable, relax your body, and bring your hands together and into your heart. Just take some few breaths with your eyes open or closed. And these are all just invitations. So just please take care of yourself and do what's comfortable to you. These, these heartbeats you're feeling, you know, these are divine vibrations. This breath coming in and out of your lungs, these are divine vibrations. These processes giving us life and bringing us here together today are divine vibrations. And so we can talk about these ancient times as though they were lost, but they are always with us and are sustaining us. And I want to honor how we're all here together in all corners of Turtle Island and we're connected here in these breaths and in these heartbeats and in the circle protected and accompanied always by our ancestors and our mountains and the spirit of the land being always with us. Let's just take a few breaths. And in this black behind our eyes is like the black of space open, open in all directions open with everything because Yulio is this vibration that is always in potentiality to become what is. And so these vibrations echoing through all of space and time becoming what is in the melody and the harmony of the universe and in just this one moment in time, a vibration makes a melody, a sound, and the sound and its beauty and its wisdom becomes Mago, becomes this goddess who is our goddess to create our world. And so what is this melody and how does this sound and how does it pluck against your senses? How do you feel into who and what Mago is among the great potentiality of the great blackness of space? And through Mago and through the seed of the divine that permeates all time, how does she take the seed and how does she drop it in the heavenly water? And how does this heavenly water spiral and catalyze and form what we know as the waters of this world? And how does the shoreline come out from the water? 
how does the light strike the shore? And how does the land open up to the mountains? And how do our first ancestors stand strong and beautiful in the four corners of creation? As Yulio passes through the sky like clouds with messages and beauty and light and color and how how do they sing in all four directions to keep life in balance and harmony for all the generations to come and how do we sing our own songs from every direction of this earth to keep the harmony for the generations who will come after us? And as these images come to your mind, Maybe you can wiggle your toes a little bit. Maybe you could feel your heart a little bit. And maybe you can come back into your body just a little bit. And know that the reality of our imagination is sometimes more real than what we perceive with our senses and is the seed for what we can bring into our waking world. Now, with your pens and your paintbrushes and your bodies and however you want to express yourself, I invite you to take um, uh, to take the next um, 15 minutes. Maybe or 15 so. minutes. Yeah, Michelle, maybe 15 minutes. Uh, and, um, and just uh, go wild. And then we'll come back together after that and share. And there'll be some music. And um, if you want to throw up any messages in the chat, um, we can respond to that too in this time. While you're working, I think we might play music, but if you do have any additional comment or question, you put it in the chat box and um, we'll kind of chat about those while you guys are working on your creative exercise. Um, if us chatting about those are disruptive, you know, you could probably mute us <laughs> um, or listen to music, uh, put a headset in, but just giving you guys heads up. If you guys put a question or a comment, We'll answer them while you guys are working on your creation.
Tulane is asking about if we read this book. Oh, I don't know. I can't. What did it, where did it go? I just lost it. Oh, here it is. Um, Asian settler colonialism from local governance to the habit of everyday life in Hawaii. I have not read it. Um, I don't know if anyone else read it. Misha, have you read it? I'm gonna try this. Let me know if this works. We hear it. Oh my God, yeah, I totally can hear it. I love it. <laughs> I feel like I should be dancing. Yeah, wow. I make you want to dance. <laughs> Grant asked a question. Can you speak about the role of God paintings for shaman shrines and ceremonies? In your travels to Korea, did you meet any of the artists that are commissioned to create these God paintings for shamans? Um, no, I have not met the artist. Um, right now, I'll be on, I think Korean shamanism has been very much commercialized. So I think there are people who, you can actually buy these paintings um, from a shop that sells all the other shamanic tools. Um, so you can actually buy them. So they're ma mass produced. I know of one artist who's, I think she actually, I don't know she or he, I think they went through some type of an initiation to become a shaman, but their work is um, painting this Korean shamanic painting. They follow me on Instagram, but I never talked to that person. Uh, but so I think there are some people who had the spirit calling to explore Korean shamanism, but the way they are expressing their shamanic work is through painting um, the these paintings. So, so I've seen on Instagram shoot. I don't even know her Instagram handle right now, but she she does a commission work. Um, for Korean shamans at their shrines and such. A lot of um, existing Korean shamanic shrines um, in Korea are old. These are very, these paintings are quite old. Um, some of the famous shrine uh, shamanic god paintings are quite old. Um, if, I, if I could speak to that. Um... Um, next week for Equinox, um, I'm going to be um, painting this um, uh, Filipino goddess, Lakapati, um, at my friend's farm, who's um, do, uh, creating like a, a communal mutual aid farm um, space to be growing food and sharing information and to, yeah, just kind of um uh sharing like a uh, space out in the woods that people can come and learn things and we're doing she doing the shrine there um and she's uh filipino and um doing this goddess shrine who is the um the uh the transgender uh, uh deity uh, who's like the brings the good harvest and the harvest of rice and so we're doing that painting and then opening up the painting for everyone to come and paint offerings on the, on this altar for her, and then on the full moon we're gonna activate it, um, and 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 like this process through this process this woman Donna she's like translating the prayers back into her language, speaking with her aunties to do this, and we're like bringing all of our own foods and like ancestral energy there into that work and i'm really excited about this project because i feel like it it brings home to me so much of how like um connecting back into our with our ancestors is part of this decolonial work where we remember who we are and are strengthened by those connections back and use that way that mentality of honoring the land, honoring things in the old way, and that being that way that we remember how to 
be in this world in relationship with each other. Theo, we can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, Misha gifted me this original, so I've actually used this original as my ritual painting when I went to the mountain and set up an altar and did a blessing for um, the Teborum, which is the first full moon. So for me, this is like one of my most cherished uh, shamanic paintings. I like the idea of all these artists and creatives um, repainting these, you know, energies and deities, um, rewriting the mythology and stories. Um, and that is one of the reasons I um, translated this, not to show that this is one way that we should all learn it, not from that place, but if you knew such stories existed and it kind of expanded your mind if it freed your mind a little so you could actually create your own interpretation of divinity and how you live in this body in connection to this divinity like what painting could you make just like Misha did and what you guys are doing right now you know what writings could you write you know what what more, what could we create as creatives who gathered here and being Korean American Sandra asking, can you share more about how Confucianism may have come out of Samshin philosophy? Um, in the appendix of Budoji, there's a discussion of the Samshin philosophy because this was the original, the indigenous kind of a wisdom that came before ancient China and ancient Korea kind of split off. Um, there is a suggestion that perhaps that came from so Samshin philosophy influenced Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. It's on page 113 of the book. Um, I think it's one, you know, I, 
Um, I could see a point in it. I don't know if it, it is because Confucius was a person, you know, he might have had his own philosophy and his ways. Um, I don't know to just kind of define that that came out of Samshin philosophy, although the book, uh, Professor Cho, who wrote this, um, believes it. And I think there's a school of thought that in Korea that believes it. But according to that, on page 113, um, th there's a similarity, similarities in um, energy, working with energy. So Confucianism focuses on controlling the energy, desires and energy. So it's all about control. Confucianism is all about control in the practice of body, bodily control, uh, sensations, desires. Um, so there's a lot of respect and should and should not, you know, things like that. So philosophy that discussed in this book is Confucianism is around resisting physical desires, control behaviors and actions, and use that energy in proper good ways to reach a state of goodness and honor. So the only similarity that I can see from Samshin philosophy, it was using of an energy and it's trying to reach the light, reach that wisdom, reach the goodness. But Confucianism's way of that goodness was being proper, right? Having control um, and having this structure um, and abstaining from desires and abstaining the, this control of energy to affect the goodness. That I don't know if it's something, but you know, the similarity is work of use of an energy and then trying to reach that that connection, that divinity, the goodness. Um, and that's, I think, Confucianism is. I hope I'm answering that question. Yeah, one, he said Confucianism is rational thinking. Yeah, rational according to who? Them. Uh, Confucian, <laughs> you know. Um, but at least that came from like they know better they want to reach the righteousness the rightness you know the 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 goodness properness um but depending on who right who who's the narrator it all changes so that's why i have a problem with it but i'm sure you know but it is it, it is what it is <laughs> All right, let's just talk about this. Let's share some. Misha, how should we go about this? You're on mute. Okay. Um, well, does anyone um, want to go ahead and share what they've created? Can we do that? Yeah, we could raise hands if you are willing to share. Please raise hands and um, do we also want to go out of spotlight mode? Maybe Good. bring us all together. Come on, this is our worst nightmare when we say please share and nobody shares. <laughs> And we're all staring at each share. other. Okay. I will share, Sio. Actually, I, uh, hi, I'm Marianne. Um, I, uh, actually, before I even started being part of this Pudoji program, I was doing a lot of these, like, vibrational energy drawings prior to this. And it kind of evolved into a very mountainous landscape. And then it, I, Korea is just mountains and hills and so beautiful. And so in the first, I was like, I was, when I first read Putoji, I was like, oh my God, okay, like, 
I want to do something with like all the vibrations and yin and yang and yo and all that stuff. And I was like, like writing, doing like the peace sign and everything. But then it eventually just kind of led into these landscapes like this. And then, and this is, this is a, just a quick one, like a sketch, but then it's in the colors of like, black and yellow and blue and red and keeping it within the colors of the elements of Budoji. And then, and then it became more concentrated like this a duality and it putting in the dualities of the vibrations together. And so I'm still developing it, but it's coming out to be like this. And it's very- oh, I love it. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So far, it's red and black, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so yeah, I want to incorporate these landscapes of Korea, but then also the mountains of, I live in LA and I'm also surrounded by mountains here. And it's weird because you don't think of like, lands you don't think of comparing the landscape of LA and Korea or at least to me it's so different when I think of Hollywood Hills and I think of like the Korean mountains they are not the same and even that connection though is a really interesting connection but also a disconnect that I'm also figuring out through my drawings but it's about I really want to hone in the vibrations and the energies and the elements. Yeah, and that Yulia energy, source energy, it doesn't matter where you are, right? Yes, we're Korean. Yes, the stories on Korean indigenous Korean stories, but it but source is everywhere. Um, oh. So you could potentially tap into that energy wherever you are. Even let's say you went to Portugal just for vacation. There's no reason why you couldn't tap into that energy for your creative process, you know? Mm. Sources. I everywhere. think. I love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, I think. And this, go ahead, Nisha. Sorry. Oh, and, and this is the vision of the medicine wheel, too, of the four directions, you know, four races of people, you know, in all the directions. And it's like, we're here and the, like that kind of um, uh, like myth making and way of thinking about the way the universe is constructed, like it's very resonant to the belief systems here. And so it, yeah, it really makes me feel like how the resonance between this land and our homeland, like that, that that's already there and then also like this is the mother earth you know and so like we're we're always on mother earth i see julia and jackie are willing to share i can get dressed Oh, I think you're freezing a little. Uh, um, Julia, Jackie, can you speak again? Mm, your connection must be, you keep freezing. Oh. Go ahead. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, we're actually, we're not from the LA area. We actually live in Ohio. Um, but, uh, you know, I found out about this online and was really excited to be here. But um, I was trying to think about how to interpret uh, vibrational energy. And um, this is what I painted. And I was thinking about the different elements of the world. And so there's rocks and water. And 
This is my interpretation of the energy. We're probably. That's gorgeous. I think they're lacking, but mm -hmm. those rocks look like Jeju rocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Uh, Kathy, didn't you say that um, this creation they could submit it and you will sh you might be sharing them? Yes, please. Um, you know, feel free to upload and tag Kyopo on Instagram. Um, if you don't have Instagram, feel free to email it in. Um, I can put the email in the chat, but please take photos and share with us. These are so beautiful. And then we'll we'll reshare. Yeah, I would love to save it myself and you know, just feel feel good about everything. <laughs> Whenever I need warm and fussy, I'll look at it. Um, the next person, uh, Julia, Jackie, are you done or were you sharing something else? That there are two of you. I think the connection was difficult. Let me just con continue because we have limited time. Let's go to Wanhee. Uh, Wanhee wanted to share. Hi, uh, thank you so much um, for opening the space up and really just yeah, all the work that went into having this translation. Um, so beautiful just to hear all of this in in English, like in a way that's accessible, like it's 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 so meaningful. Um, so thank you so much, um, and I. Um, I, I, I do med, uh, I do Korean knot work and I, then I was nodding throughout this whole program and, um, I made this bell. Wow. And with wow. the I like really felt the vibrations. Like I used the bell and, um, uh, I made this, this for me was like a mountain shape. <laughs> it might not look like it, but I was like really thinking about the mountains and, um, I've been making med for like, uh, the last two years and. Um, I've been really, uh, res like really trying to like practice like restraint against like working with the number four, right? Cause like in Chinese, it's like the character is death and like in Korean, like, so in Korea, like the number four in Ch is bad luck. So I've been like, you know, I never do my cordage and like, you know, four feet or I never make four knots in a row, like I'm really avoiding it. But reading the Pudo, I was like, oh shit, there are four elements. Like there's there's four, like the sacred four. Like it's, so I've been trying to like, um, you know, be more gentle on on that rule of four and bringing that into the knot work. And um, so, yeah, this is my first knot with four things, <laughs> four, four knots in four. Awesome. Yay, you're breaking free from these rules that we don't even know. You know what I mean? conditioning and programming you're freeing yourself i love it and it's That's, beautiful yeah that makes me think of the numbers 12 and 13 you know it was like oh it's like the, thir the lunar connection to 13 but then it went to 12 in the solar calendar it's kind of like yeah like oh we don't know why we do certain things sometimes it's just yeah yeah, because I couldn't, I knew about the four thing, but I always work in fours. Have I just been putting bad luck on me this whole time? Yeah, it comes because uh, death, Chinese letter for death is ha. Right. So it sounds just like ha number four. So it's like kind of, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't worry. About, I wouldn't worry about it. One, he, okay, you do whatever you. number you want. <laughs> and you, Mary, and you too. I, I, think I mean, certain, I know in certain cultures, like even in Japan or China, they don't have like a fourth floor in buildings, right? That's Same like thing. a real thing. Yeah. Korea too. That's like all East Asian. Oh, things. okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, but um, Sharon wanted to share. Sharon. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you guys for the workshop and also everyone else for sharing. Um, I guess like the theme of like mountains and stuff just kind of got to me. So this is I mean, I was just vibing in bed. So during the workshop, I was just drawing. I guess it's like a like a goddess guiding someone up the mountains. Um, so that was just the sketch that came to mind. 
Um, and also I was kind of picking at this other thing that I'm working on, um, which is also uh, like I, I make my like digital art for my game and it's also like set in Korea and the mountains and stuff. Oh. So there are these two. But, yeah. That's awesome. God, you guys did this in such a short period of time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That was awesome. Uh, I want to, Sam, Sam wanted to share. Hi, thank you everyone for, for putting everything together and everybody for sharing. Everything's looked amazing so far. Um, when I was in interpreting just um, the guidance that Misha was providing, I also thought a lot about like mountains and water. And I guess my thought process was like the visualization of vibration and how that looks like waves. And I just have a connection with the ocean. So what I pictured in my mind and tried to put down quickly was like a face that you could see in profile in waves that was mirrored in the sky above with the rain feeding and then moving into the shore in a mountainous line. So I got like halfway there. <laughs> It's going to look terrible because of the glare, but... Can you back up a little for us? Oh, okay. We, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. So just a quick sketch. <laughs> I love the concept, the face profile in the water and then reflecting back. It's just, it's like a divine moment of this magic, you know. I, I love to see it when you kind of do it. Please share it when you kind of not necessarily finish it but do more thank you for sharing all right it's 6 45 exactly the time we're supposed to stop but if one more person if anyone wants to share one more if you're like oh i want you to share please raise hands or comment and if not we could move on just want to All right. Oh, I think you raised hand. Yeah, I'm not sure how I can share this because it's like a, a audio clip. Um, but maybe I could just share encouragement mm -hmm. that when I learned about Mago and the eight tones um, four years ago, it really kickstarted a music practice for me. Like that was like the only way I felt like I could truly embody um, this, especially because the community work I do is is documentary and video work, which is so digital and, you know, very not embodied. So I was like, you know, like I think having a music practice, uh, I've been working on it here and there like every, you know, few months when I can. And I made this clip, I think in 2021. So I haven't, you know, um, I made this song like in 2021 and then I'm going to Korea actually in two weeks. And so I'm hoping that oh. I could pick up, you know, a different flow and just get back into music practice. But I wanted to share with y'all that like, you know, learning of our indigenous spiritualities is really what I don't know, keeps me going in any creative practice. So I hope Amazing. they Kathy, on. they made you, uh, we made you a co-host. So if you want to share it, you could, I think you could share, Kathy, does she share a screen and play? Is that what, uh, how it works? You, you can, um, if you do share a screen at the bottom, is that an option for you now? And then you can go to um, advanced. Okay, got you. Here, audio, and then click share. And then I think there's a share sound button on the bottom left too. Okay, cool. Yeah, I like clipped it in Premiere. There, it's like two minutes, but actually, I only clipped a little bit of it, so y'all can hear a more instrumental version. Um, I didn't mix any of like vocals or anything like that, but um, just as a uh, to let you know, because there's so much talk about frequencies, um, I was playing around with those, and also if anyone's heard of overtone singing, which is um, every culture has different overtone types of overtone singing, but I mean, especially within Mongolia and Siberia, um, it's when your voice kind of splits into two and you can kind of, you have one undertone and then you can control your overtone with your tongue. Um, so the part of the vocals that you do here is that happening. 
um, you'll hear like a whistle that comes after the undertone. So let me try to share. Um, I'll just quickly say also for folks, if you could DM your images as well, not just sharing and tagging us, but do both. Um, and you can also just DM it to us just so we have high quality images so we can share maybe in a post. That would be great. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, you. Sorry. Thank you all for being patient. Um, my laptop screen is actually broken, so I have to like use the monitor. Okay, I'll share with you all a little clip. Yeah, so that, as you heard, is um, where one, like I said, the voice kind of splits into the whistle register. And um, it's just like playing around with frequencies and vocal techniques, like that has been something that was really inspired and in music production um, after, um, you know, connecting to our indigenous spiritualities. Um, and I just really want to see more people in the diaspora use music use their bodies, their voices, um, even if it's drumming or dance, because dance is music too. And I just want to encourage everybody, like, please do that. You know, like we really need, um, I feel like I need more people to like make music with and to really dance with. Um, and I hope to see that kind of cultural movement like within our, our diaspora. That was so amazing. What a treat to be able to listen to it <laughs> and just kind of get a little glimpse of that magic. Yeah. I've never shown anyone. Said, so I, besides my partner and my two close friends, so y'all, you know, um, I really feel some trust and I was surprised. I did not expect to share this. So um, I, I just feel really good with y'all. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Awesome. I think we're at six um three fifty one your time. So I think Hetty, I think we are ready for that part of our presentation. Yeah, of course. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Hetty. Uh, I think it is time to close out. Um, but before we close, we wanted to uh, invite Sio and Misha to speak about projects that they've been working on that are coming up in the future. Uh, Sio and Misha, did you have time to tell us about your upcoming work and how we can keep following your work? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you. This book, uh, Korean Folktale for Feminist Retelling, went to print. Um, so I have this book. It's going to be available. It's a a lot of Korean folk tales are harmful uh, because of patriarchy and misogyny and classism and all, all things. Um, so four feminist authors in Korea rewrote this. So that book is actually going to be available soon. And what I really related to this Pudoji, what I really would love people support is I have a Kickstarter right now on memoir of Kim Gum Ha Man Shin. Um, it's translated English translation of it. The book's been out of print since 2009. Uh, finally got a publishing right from the successor, the memoir itself. So the the it's a translation of this memoir in entirety, but because this was published in 15 years ago um, and Kim Guma has passed, there's a whole section about four or five chapters of her successor, her niece and a spirit daughter who's carrying on the legacy so her like the the aunt and spirit mother she remembers her shamanic you know journey like her life as a shaman and so there's like a new content also so i've already met the initial goal thanks to all the support but then i hit that i don't know if you guys do kickstarter crowdfunding but it, it hit that dreaded mid, mid middle where it's like nothing is happening so if you guys could share if you find me on instagram and you could share it talk about it um just bring it up some 
energies to have more people come look at it, I would really appreciate it. This is very beautiful. I'm, I can't wait for you guys to read this. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. That looks absolutely incredible. Um, Misha, I actually had a question for you. I know that you have a poetry chapbook chap coming up and you've described it um, on one of your posts on Instagram, I believe. You described it as a record of a woman's complicated existence streaming through dystopia. Um, and when you take into your account your work as an artist and an earth worker, what allows you to be able to dream and envision better words through dystopia? Thank you. Oh boy. <laughs> um, I don't know. We dream because we we must, you know, and that's what's required of us now. And um, and yeah, just like why not dream like impossible dreams? I respect so many people here for their their dreaming. Um, it sometimes feels like if we can dream collectively, like hard enough together, that at least we are being, um, we are being like authentic and who we are and living up into our purpose. So, um, so yeah, it, I guess it, it's sorry. <laughs> uh, it's uh, yeah. It, I guess it's a survival habit. Um, yeah. And I read the chat book. It's it's beautiful. I can't wait for you guys to see it. Um, hopefully when we, I know you guys will mention the February event, but we hope to meet you guys in person um, in February. So get to see these books too at the time. Yes, and so speaking of that event, Kyopo will be hosting an in-person event uh, highlighting um, the work of these uh, artists and shamans. We'll be sharing a lot more information about that event in the months to come. Um, and if you don't have any more questions or comments, uh, Kyopo is also welcoming volunteers into our community. This is an event uh, announcement that we wanted to make. If you're interested in working within the Kyopo comms or programs committees, please reach out to Kyopo by email. And of course, like Kathy said earlier, if you created a piece of work today during the program that you'd like us to share, uh, you can DM it to us directly on IG or post it to us and tag Kyopo. Today's event will be recorded and was, it will be available on YouTube and Kyopo's website. Um, and again, thank you so much for this beautiful program, everyone. Uh, creating together and sharing together was just a really magical experience. Thank you. Um, and Thank you so much, Hetty. Thank you so much, all our speakers and all of you for so generously sharing. It's like, I don't know if I've experienced this much love online and Zoom before. Um, so I think it's really a testament to everyone's energies and presence here. And I just want to thank CEO and Misha once again, and CEO especially also um, has offered a, a promo code for everyone who's registered for this event, which we'll be sharing um, right after via email, but you can also know it's pretty simple. It's Kyopo. Um, and that's for CEO's course on Pudoji, um, which we'll be sharing a link for uh, via email. Um, and so thank you so much again for your generosity with the Kyopo community. And thank you all for sharing. Um, does anyone else have any questions or any last minute things to share? Or CEO, would you like to say something? No, thank you for having us. This has been so wonderful. I don't want it to end, but it must. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Nisha and Sio, um, some Kyopo volunteers are going to stay on for a sec to debrief. So if you have to run, feel free, but we'd also love to just chat. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone.